it's a great honor also to read with Cyrus Cassell's awesome and Lisa Huffaker beautiful work and um, as a martial artist I'm trained to get up after great things and try to live up to that so that's what I'm going to do I'll start with a poem called A Certain Joy there is a certain joy that depends on nothing one inhabits it it is there in the day when you walk out, whether chill and gray or magnified by light, and you inhale it. Now it is in your blood, and it fills you to the skin, wraps a tightness around your heart. It is in you, yes, and equally in the world, where it speaks from the darkest rose in your neighbor's garden, or the bright metallic flash of an absurdly tiny bird copper and green and red in the glinting air. The city streets are miraculous. <coughs> they wind downhill through the trees. The smell of smoke from the houses, sweet nostalgia. This in spite of everything. If you met a stranger, his face obscured in the hood of his night black cowl, you would say, how the sun glints on the beautiful curve of your blade. This is called Breakdown. It's when memory collapses that human machinery is most bared. Things don't mesh. Ideas pronounced with certainty meet awkward stares. The flesh cannot accept the simplest commands. A belt becomes a puzzle. A razor loses meaning in one's hands. There is an almost audible grinding of gears, of thought scraping down through a knot of aluminized wires. We expect such breakdowns in cars, but not in ours, that is, in those, from those whom we have loved, in whose eyes we thought the sparks meant spirit. With the car, we did not hurry it aside, abashed, buckled by the loss, fearing for our own internal works. Now, like uh, Lisa, I write a lot of sonnets. I have no agenda in that. I simply, uh, they come out that way. That's how they come out. <laughs> so this next one uh, is a sonnet called the face of things. Anybody here a philosophy student? No, okay. I was going to say this is my uh, sonnet about the phenomenology of perception. <laughs> uh, but for you guys it can be my sonnet about uh, seeing a hummingbird in a tree. <laughs> the face of things. The eye knows leaf from hummingbird at once, even at distance, even dusk, discerns among the flecks of green an imminence of sudden flight, as though the will returns a subtle wavelength visible as light. The green of foliage, the leafy green of matching feather, then a clever slight of surface that the tr conveys a deeper scene, the heartbeat underneath. The eye both in and measuring the world, an inborn task that even camouflage won't contravene, cannot help pointing back behind the mask. Depth cannot hide, and so it flutters, sings, betrays itself upon the face of things. Now, um, as, as you said, I came from Oakland, California, but I'm half Texan. My mother was uh, from El Paso, and I spent many vacations in childhood here in Texas, and one always has to decide what to read at a reading, so I decided I would pick a few poems that had Texas in them in some way. So um, this one, we used to go to El Paso and go out in the desert 
hunting for arrowheads and bringing interesting things back. And this is about one of those science fair. This is a vertebra from a cow. Big as my hands, this bare bone, bleached and parched by its time in the desert sun. Notice the transverse process, the spinous process, the vertebral foramen, that tube through which the spinal cord would run, like a necklace wire or a string of lights sparking and humming with life. Here it is a lost bead, its beauty not accidental, these sculpted curves and polished holes for the passage of nerves and blood. In a scatter of weathered stones, it would announce itself familiar. So it did when we came hunting arrowheads, a white spill of bones dispersed on a hummock of sand. I was small enough. I crouched in the arching rib cage, held a leg bone in my two hands, the skull too heavy to drag by its horn back home, I took instead this vertebra, once a part of a swaying spine that was hung with a hammock of cow who ambled among arrowheads and ate and saw perhaps the stars at night, white and scattered like bones, and died at last a simple or an awful death. Now here, plain and labeled, no blinking lights nor fancy models. This is a vertebra from a cow. It speaks for itself. It will win no prize. It is just the childish wonder from which the rest derives. Now, I forgot to start my little timer here, so I don't know where I am. And uh, another feature of Texas was buzzards. Uh, Turkey vultures back home, and that's the ones in this poem are uh, back home in Oakland. Vulture flock. Not enough death today for the vultures, so they clown together, wheeling and climbing like kids in the hills on bikes. Spread fingered, V winged, they teeter and glide. Buzzard circles spiral wide and down and down to a point, then skim among the houses so close their size amazes, casting shadows big as planes. A child cranes to see as small dogs scatter, they clatter and land, gather on a roof in a group. O oh, black cabal, O oh, boaters of ill, flesh red faces, terrible in daylight, wings spread and raised like capes, a row of sun drenched Draculas, startling the neighbors till shade comes and one by one they fold, move edgeward, lean their weight on a draft and swoop away like shadows, switching back through the trees toward a distant roar, the freeway sound which to us means travel, to them means skunk or possum, even deer. <laughs> you're allowed to laugh, guys. <laughs> you're, you're supposed to laugh. Uh, one more. Cattle guards. That's another Texas thing. <laughs> and, uh, you have a little check on this, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, Texas things. Cattle guards. I've, I've got one on that. Uh, and especially those ones that are just painted on. <laughs> False cattle guard. <laughs> the cows disappoint. That will to greener pastures stopped short by a painted on grate. Bovine trunk loy. And we had so admired the slow current of their wisdom accepting as impassable the genuine gaps and rails on the weight of self-knowledge, wobbly hooves, delicate hawks. Now they are made fools, gathered in loose groups, moon-eyed and thwarted at the slant end of the fence. Much as we might gather at the wide-spaced slats of change, unable to risk a step. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bats. We're in Austin here. 
It's next on my list. Uh, this one, uh, last time I was in Austin, which was a long time ago, it turns out, we did go down and see all the bats coming out. This poem, though, is really set back home where they aren't so uh, numerous and celebrated. <laughs> and it's a sonnet. It's called Exiting the Night. By living late and sleeping late, we miss the moment when the bats come home to roost, when crooked shadows flit in jagged loops that seem to seek the chimney, seem to miss, then somehow disappear into the eaves. And they, the bats, tuck wing to fur to wing in crevices and roof beam beveling, doze through our nearly diametric lives, invisible as brown on brown, until today, wakened by dreams, I caught a slight compelling corner glimpse in gray first light of sudden motion in the mostly still new dawn. And drawn, I rose to see the flight, our dark companions exiting the night. <laughs> and now, I want to give a little nod to my martial arts friends. Some of them took the trouble to come here and uh, hear me read. So we'll do a little bit of zen <laughs> for those guys. And also, I just love the cover of my book. And uh, this one, there are a few poems with frogs and toads that account for that picture. Uh, and this is one of those. It's called December Meditation, and it has an epigraph. The wood frog, Rana Silvatica, embraces winter with its ability to freeze solid without ill effect. Its organs are infused with glucose, a natural antifreeze. Thawing on the forest floor, it's often the first species to emerge in spring for mating. December Meditation. How unfit we are for Zen, warm-blooded, bony need at odds with winter. One hard chill and we roil with questions, clamor with desires. Even the willing monks in Damo's time were fitful and prone to collapse, and their heroes to desperate acts, razored eyelids, severed limbs, the snow made scarlet. It is for Shen Kuang's arm that the monks now greet with one hand only. Had he but turned that day as he knelt in the cold, laid eyes on a glistening frog, understood its gift, how it dons gelid winter like a top coat of porcelain glaze. Surely the monks would greet today by pressing both their hands. Surely we'd meet the season's sway with sweeter equanimity. Now, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Mm. I was considering, I think I'll skip reading the title poem, Greed, a Confession, so that you'll have to buy the book <laughs> in order to get it. Um, and, uh, okay. I'll, I'll wrap up. Is that what you're saying, John? No. Okay. I get it. I have a ton of sonnets about birds, and so it probably wouldn't be honest not to read at least one sonnet about birds. So, uh, oh, I did, though, didn't I? I had a hummingbird already. Well, let's do a pigeon. <laughs> let's do a pigeon. This one has an epigraph, too. It's called Pigeon Rock Dove. There is evidence some birds can see the stars in daylight. What other secrets have you, claret-eyed, pin-headed genius in disguise? <laughs> I can't but see you with new eyes, so oddly slant of step, so slovenly of nest, you hide your pied blue brilliance, cleverly astride this daftly cooing clumsiness. Beak bent to pecking pavement, soiling as you hunt discarded seeds and scraps. 
And yet, inside that feathered skull, the universe is drawn in fine magnetic clouds, in starry sky and subtle shifts of light, in infrared, and eyeing me, it seems, even at noon, you see the breadth of space and wonder why I cling so tightly to my crust of bread. <laughs> and I'll do, uh, I'll do an owl, and then I'll wrap up. Do you have any hills in Austin? Is it hilly here? Mm. Yes. Becomes hilly later? In the west. Okay. It's all relative. That's true. That's true. Owls in the city hills, how they hunt us, casting their deep vowels like feathered hooks to pull us from shallow sleep or simple talk and out to the night, the stand of eucalyptus, a looming silhouette, the black above us. We, barefoot on the littered deck and blind, stare wide into the dark and hear the sound move eerily from tree to tree around us. Our backs to the spreading net of city lights below, we've nothing but the trees, our eyes, the dark, the sound, these owls we cannot see. Though once at dusk by chance, I saw one light and spread its wings and tinged by copper skies, lay silence to the city utterly. And now, this last one, where is it? This is kind of a nod to Zen, another Zen one for my martial arts guys. This is a nod to Kay Ryan's poetry, which, uh, to which really I owe the fact that I started writing again and eventually this book together. Um, the nod to Kay Ryan is in the style a bit. And she does a lot of uh, common phrases interpreted or termed. Simplicity itself. Not glue that binds a multiplicity of simple things, nor lard to grease complexity and smooth its many quirks, but the muted spark that brings about the mad enlightenment of monks, a moat that settles lightly on the purest liquid of the mind, which then begins to crystallize, a rapid chain that, once it has begun, will spiral on till everything is one 